Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Man to Man, where I bring on guys who I think are very interesting uh, and have something to say about masculinity. And today we are joined by the esteemed Jack Donovan. How you doing, Jack? I'm doing all right. Well, really pumped to have you here. Uh, I actually read your book, The Way of Men, probably about when it came out, because when I got into uh, coaching men, it was about 10 years ago, and your ideas on masculinity like really um, influenced me significantly because a lot of the stuff prior to um, your work, you know, I'm no expert in terms of like the, the, the history of men's work, but a lot of the stuff that, you know, I was exposed to was more of like what the, I guess you could call the mythopoetic movement, um, where, yeah. where it was like very kind of abstract as to like what it was to be a man. And I almost felt like I needed like a uh, degree in Jungian psychology to sort of sort my way through that. But yours was your perspective you put it out in the way of men was pretty hard hitting. And I remember like the big thing that hit me was this idea of like there is a difference between being a good man and being good at being a man. Can you explain that a little bit to our audience here? Yeah, that, that's so important, and it's that distinction is so important, and it's become even more important over the years. Uh, and uh, basically, the problem that I ran into when I started to talk about defining masculinity, and what, what are we actually talking about? When we look at another man, and we're like, you know, he is masculine, he is not, what are we seeing? You know, rather than just cultural markers, because that's a criticism that feminism has is that, oh, you're just, you know, this culture says this, and this culture said that, so masculinity doesn't mean anything because it changes all the time. But the reality is that it, it, many features of it don't, you know, masculinity, you know, if you were talking to an ancient Roman or like someone in medieval times or, you know, someone who's Islamic, a lot of the features of masculinity would be the same. Right. And I was trying to figure out what they, those were. So the difference, the, the problem is that if you talk about masculinity and morality at the same time, morality changes from religion to religion and group to group and perspective versus perspective, our team versus their team. So their team is always going to be bad guys and therefore not truly men. Right. Uh, you know, and that's the way people define it. And it makes it really easy to, I mean, it's really, a, you know, so you feel comfortable killing them later. <laughs> but the, the I mean, that's the way we're set up. Yeah. But if you confuse masculinity and morality like that and just make it all about team sports, then you really don't know what you're talking about. Right. You're talking so, about like, different so, things. Yeah, if you really so to really talk about masculinity by itself, I needed to find out what it was outside of morality and outside of being on my team or someone else's team, and uh, so that's you know the big difference is what, what that primal thing that we're really seeing, right? Uh, you know, is is what masculinity really is, and the rest of it is you know being a good man. You know, what be which being a good man to your tribe might mean something different than being. Uh, the good man of some other tribe. Like I, we've always said, suicide bombers. Uh, you know, they're good to somebody. You know, <laughs> like, right. like they're, yeah, someone's they're, promoting that value. They're guys. They're doing a heroic thing. Right. And and so like that morality is a big big, big change. But uh, you know, if you take outside of that, are they not men anymore? Well, of course they're men. They're doing something that's really scary. <laughs> right. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, so it's. I think that you know, once you separate those two things, then you uh, you're talking about a different. You know, it's easy to parse those things out. Yeah, and as you're saying that, it hit me like uh, the morality. Like you can look at the the different moralities in the world that are competing for dominance to you know control the narrative, control the laws, whatever. It almost seems like if I was going to think about it uh, from this perspective of like competing moralities, the morality that wins is the one that has most the most men who are good at being men. What do you think of that? At least that's the way it's been historically. We're in a weird time right historically, now. Historically, that's been historically that's probably <laughs> been the case. Uh, I don't know if that's the way the world works right now. It might be that who has the most bitcoin or whatever. I don't know. It's like whoever wins may be about money, it may not be a, a, anything to do with masculinity at all. Um so you know that that becomes a little confusing. But uh, historically, yeah, that's, you know, the strongest men win and they write the rules and they write history later. You know, there was someone online, I think Ajax said the other day uh, was, uh, you know, there are no, you know, there are no war crimes for winners. 
uh, <laughs> you, right. you know, yeah. that's, that's how that works. Uh, you know, like you only punish the losers, you don't punish the winners for what they did. Uh, right. so that's the way history has always worked. So, but you've always had, yeah, they, you know, the men who were the best at being men were winning, except for when you had, you know, obviously a big disadvantage, you know, like, you know, with the North America, you had people who had a major technological disadvantage exactly and uh they they were hard they, they were hard as fuck <laughs> you know like the, the oh, Indians, absolutely. They'll, 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 they'll cut you you know cut your scalp off they'll do all kinds of, they'll fight to the death but i mean they were manly guys but that doesn't mean that they had guns right <laughs> you know like they didn't have guns and cannons and, and a, a trained military right so that's a different you know feature so there are other factors but yeah Absolutely. And, and that's actually one of the pieces here. So like, you know, you're talking about being good at being a man that comes down to these tactical virtues. What are they? It's like courage. Uh, I forget. Strength, them. courage, mastery and honor. OK. And like, you know, as you increase in those, you become better at being a man, which means you become essentially more useful to your tribe, to your group of other men who, you know, they rely on you. Right. And I'm curious, where does technological prowess fit into that would that be the mastery side of things because you know in that example for that you just gave like that's that's a game changer like the person who's got the technology the you know you got muskets they got bows you know <laughs> end of it yeah i mean you know and that's that's how we all prove our value in in the tribes because we're not all equally gifted right uh you know like uh there's the guy who you know might not be the strongest guy there might not be the most courageous guy there but uh, he figured out a better way to, you know, shoot sticks at people from far away. And, and right. uh, that's arrows. You want to talk about a game changer, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's the first big game changer, you know. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of different skills that men have. And, yeah, I feel like that fits under mastery. You know, okay. like that's all the other things that men can do. We're all not equally good at fighting. You know, like I'm not going to go out and, and boss around a bunch of, uh, you know, special forces guys. For sure. Uh, they've, they've done the thing. They, they know what they're doing and they have an aptitude in that area. Um, you know, um, I'm good at art, you know, <laughs> and so if I can write art that supports them, then that's how I show my value in the tribe. OK, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. And that's a that's a good way to to approach it. Um, and I want to talk about more about your art a little bit later, but. Here's some like I was going through my notes that uh, it was kind of funny reading through my notes because they were like, you know, so old from uh, the, the way of men. And one of the things that popped out of me, you were talking about how I think you say masculinity is about being a man within a group of men. Above all things, masculinity is about what men want from each other. And it's kind of from that mentality you derive the tactical virtues because like, you know, that's, you know, you're in a small group. I need this from you. I need you strength, honor, courage, uh, the other mastery um, makes total sense. But it seems like what men want from each other today has changed. So what do you think about that? Like, does does do we need to revert back to an old way of being or is there a new man that must be born? Because you know, we see today that's basically what they're pushing for. They're pushing for a different kind of man. They're saying this old version of masculinity, it's outdated. We need to shed it like a snake shedding its skin so that we can evolve into a better society. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, uh, you know, that, that relies on a fundamentally flawed idea of what evolution is and how it works. Uh, you know, like we don't like lose human nature because some people wrote some articles in the Atlantic. Uh, no, you know, like, that's not how it works. It I thought that away. was the science. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, that's not how human nature works. And and you see that when we when we uh, don't acknowledge what human nature is all the time, uh, you know, bad things happen uh, because people don't behave like they imagine in a university that they might behave if we just tell them to. Uh, you know, people still you know have primal desires. They still you know they're they're not going to stop wanting you know to compete with each other. Uh, in, in whatever way is, is necessary. And, and uh, so, you know, the idea that we should just evolve is something that we can't do. That's not how evolution works. Um, so, and when I always, when I hear that question, I'm like, we're, we're outdated and we're not useful anymore or whatever. Well, for who? Mm -hmm. Like, who, who am I working for that I need to like, please, you know, like, because the people who are writing these articles and saying these things, 
um, I'm not useful for them. In fact, I'm a problem for them. Mm -hmm. If I still be, if I still retain my masculinity and still, you know, do all this because I'm threatening to them. Sure. Uh, men, men who are, and you see this all the time, men will complain about it because they're like, I raised my voice at work and was mildly authoritative and I, I scared people, you know, right. and, uh, and that's because they're so used to baby talk and like women talk and whatever. And, uh, and so like, they're threatened by your masculinity. That's why they want it to go away. But I don't work for them. I mean, if I was working for a company, I do work for them. But like, I'm not here to please whoever is doing that. Right. Um, I'm here to, to live my life just like anybody else. And uh, so to be the best version of me, um, that involves getting in touch with that primal part of my nature. It doesn't mean that I, I you know, run over and bash my neighbor with a rock because that's what we used to do in like, you know, whatever BC. Right. But it does mean that, you know, I need to an outlet for those drives. And, I, you know, I, I'm not necessarily going to just decide that I'm, I want to be, you know, exactly like a woman, which is what right. they're always saying. They're like, you should be more like a woman is what they really mean by, you know, you, uh, new masculinity always means more like a woman. It doesn't mean like something else. It always means less masculine. Uh, so, you know, as you said about that, you know, we we're talking about technology and how that changes things and what men need from each other. I still think, I think men are really actually really hungry to be around men that have that aspect to them. It doesn't mean that we all need to go out on war parties every day. Uh, you know, that's not really, and, and, and sports is the way that societies have dealt with that uh, throughout history. It's like, well, when we don't have a war, right. here's a game for you guys to play. <laughs> you know, so, and you know, like all these sports, like they, they use a lot of the, the same tactical virtues as, as uh, you know, like you know, if you practice martial arts, well, I'm not actually killing somebody. I am doing the work of killing somebody and learning right. how to do that and exercising that part of myself that needs to do that, but in a productive, healthy way. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, like we, we still need to acknowledge that part of that and channel it in, in some way. But you also see, you know, like the idea that we're outdated is, is a little bit foolish as well, because, you know, like you look at, you know, whatever you think about what's going on in Ukraine, I don't even really kick. It's not my thing, but whatever is going on these people who were told were told that they're part of the modern world and they're part of like the great civilization and and that uh, they will never need to have tactical virtues or do anything are walking around with guns in their hands right now right you know like defending their their city so maybe you know maybe just because things are good right now you know and we saw this you know with 2020 and everything that went down like a whole bunch of things changed real fast and you aren't able to like rely on what you were relying on before right uh, you know like and so and we're seeing that you know over the world as as uh people were seeing that in major cities where there's more and more crime now right uh, you know they're like they're having to worry about defending themselves and like what if someone comes into my house and and uh what if someone tries to take what i have uh people have to think about that because everybody knows that the police are not coming to fix that they're coming to clean it up right so and then as crime you know as we're probably looking at a long economic down, downturn and as that as that progresses, people are going to need to worry about those things more and more. So I think that the almost the, the time where you could say, this is time for this to go away. Um, the people who are saying that now are the people who want to control us. Yes. And, you know, like the, the idea that we'll never need these skills again is false because uh, we may need them very soon. Right. It's it's interesting you talk about the, the powers that want to control us because, you know, you got to wonder why we don't have to wonder too hard, but why the powers that be sided with feminism? Because, you know, it's like they don't give a shit about you. Know, everyone knows that like anyone with a, half a brain knows that they don't really give a shit about like the whatever philosophy of the week or whatever, you know, the, the position on the thing is um, yeah. they don't care. But why would they side with feminism? What's what's the advantage? I'm sure you're you're able to articulate that for our listeners here. Oh, it's here. huge. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, obviously, well, I mean, without being coming off the wrong way, uh, with the, uh, it is the evolutionary habit of women to trade security, uh, it, to trade. Uh, sorry, it's the habit of women to trade freedom for security and resources. 
that's what they need. That's what they do. I mean, they, they have to do that. They're going to be pregnant at some point. They're going to be very vulnerable. Um, that is part of women's evolutionary strategy. They don't really care about freedom or self-determination as much as they care about security and resources. Right. Uh, because that's, that's, that's a biological women. like preference. Yeah. That's it's it's real. People don't like you to say that, but that's that's. And right. so, I mean, if you build that out, um, why do they want women to vote? Why do they want women to be more involved? Why do they want to like make women you know, let's decide with women on everything? Well, because they side with women and women are going to do what they say, because if women if they say, you know, it, it's so it's it sucks to watch, you know, because there are a lot of great women in the world, especially great you know, women who were raised with good fathers and, and, and whatever, who do understand it and do get it. But there's a you know you see you know like okay you put some kids crying on tv and all of a sudden we have to change basic laws that make sense uh you know because they they play the heartstrings with women really quick and mm -hmm. uh you know the same thing like you know like you make we're going to be unsafe uh the worst one that i've seen recently and again you know whatever the details of this issue are are irrelevant but the worst one the ones that drives me crazy i see commercials for it on tv is climate moms um, right now, yeah, they're they're having female scientists who just look like random regular chicks at their house. Are these Wikipedia call scientists and talk or to moms? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who would who would check? <laughs> yeah. uh, call and talk to mothers and answer questions about climate change because they're trying to wake women scared about climate change and like, and like drive yeah. that discussion. So they have these commercials of these these women talking to scientists like, oh, this is really a big problem. I talked to a scientist the other day and, and like get these mommies mm. on board with the science. It's the most insidious propaganda thing that I've seen. It's so it's probably gross. gonna work. That's the thing. <laughs> oh, totally. Like, totally. The, what I see with this is like, yes, there is an advantage of having like winning over, you know, the, the women, obviously, but it seems to me it's more of an indirect indirect attack on the father on the man because if like if they can minimize the men if they can make it so that you know incentivize there to not be a father in the house or that if he is he's some kind of homer simpson like schlub uh who plays second fiddle to mom then who gets to be daddy then right the 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 government right the the, yeah. the media right like and that's what they're looking for is they want the power position and the power position just the way that we're wired it's it's the man. It's the masculine role, and it's not that women can't play the power position. It's not that men can't, you know, do the nurturing position. It's just that you're not as we're not we're not a, we're not built that way. It's like you know, it's like if you're if you're a skinny, you know, little ectomorph, you're probably not built for powerlifting. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but like yeah. you'd probably be better off doing some long distance running if you want to like excel at something. And so it's just like, what are you? What are you? You know built for and it seems like that's what they're attacking is because they want that power position in the home yeah absolutely well i mean they want us dependent on the state and uh, men being in charge of their households is a barrier to them being in charge of all of us uh you know any sovereignty that men have is you know kind of a threat to their uh rule and you know like you just you want to control people as much as you can um you know from that position uh, which is unfortunate, uh, not really the way that America, America was designed, but uh, it, it, that's what's happening is, yeah, like go after the father figure, make him irrelevant. And then you just have, uh, you know, Lionel Tiger, who is actually the guy who came up with the word you know, for male bonding. Uh, he wrote a book called The Decline of Males, uh, you know, I think in the 90s, early 2000s, I think. And uh, he, he came up with a word for it called bureaugamy. And like, uh, instead of monogamy, uh, it's it's a relationship between uh, you know a bureaucracy and a woman. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, and, that's uh, like a very legitimate like marital union that exists today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, that's a, it's like a woman and the government raise their children. Right uh, is is a big thing, and they like that because they get sure. to program the kids. Uh, you know, because they the women the woman has to go to work. The the, the schools get the kids. Right. Uh, program the kids, indoctrinate them into whatever you want them to believe today. Show them who the authority figure are. The, there is no father authority figure to challenge that. There's just the authority figure of the state. And uh, that's that's the program that we've been on for a long time. And a lot of people just kind of slept on that. And, uh, you know, now we're kind of seeing the end of it because you're seeing people, you know, young kids who were raised and in, in, uh, in the school systems and so forth who were like, 
freedom is not a, a thing that we need you know oh, yeah. <laughs> like free, free speech is bad Oof. we shouldn't have free speech you know like there's all kinds of things that are just going away because just these horrendous kids like, oh, horrendous they, ideas they think they're free thinkers but uh, they're not free. they're just literally saying exactly what they were told to say oh i know it's it's nauseating in a lot of ways, but more than that, it's terrifying and sad because these people are they're robbed of the beauty of having a free, an actual free thinking mind. And one of the things I was going to mention, but I, I feel like I kind of already got an answer to is like, you know, is it is it for men to really feel like men today? Right. There's no we're, you know, most of us aren't going to go fight in any wars. We're not going to go like, you know, kill a saber tooth or anything like that. Um are all like forms of masculine outlet meant to be a LARP. You know, it's like, oh, you just got to go play a sport or, you know, play act in your, your little karate studio or whatever it is. But as we were talking about this, it kind of struck me that because of how disturbed our society has become, the morals of our culture have become, the the role of like spiritual warfare, moral warfare, of, of heading the family, that actually now seems more important than ever because like if you're going to be the head of a family and you operate with the same passivity that uh i would say was characteristic of men for the past you know 60 70 years you're going to just get sucked into the borg like you're going to be mm -hmm. uh you're screwed like your your family's going to have zero morals values uh probably be unable to to function well and so like what do you think of that as like spiritual warfare, particularly as heads of family, as a place for you know, a non LARPy sort of place for men to exercise true masculinity. Well, it's all part of the same thing. I mean, they always had to do that too. Uh, that was also part of their job was to lead their households and stuff. But they were in homogenous cultures where, like, well, ideally, where everyone kind of agreed this is a good way to sure. live. No, that's true. That's absolutely true. But I mean, I, yeah, obviously they're going to have to take a more active role in that. And and you see men doing that. There's a lot more homeschooling going on. Uh, there's a lot more men trying to figure out how they can afford to, to do homeschooling. Um, and that's, that is a, a really, you know, I mean, it's not a war. Let's not over, let's not make metaphors out of, you know, that that's a problem with modern societies. Like everything is the war. Like, uh, you know, it's a war on whatever. Um, like, well, it's not a war. War is killing people. Uh, you know, but uh, it is it is important. Obviously, it's it's a it's a task. Yeah. And it's an important task. And it's it's it is something that men need to devote their time to if that's what they if they have a family and so forth. Um, you know, and and we also have the the question out there that there's a lot of obviously because of the way we've been raised for X amount of generations. There's also going to be a lot of guys who don't have families. Right. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do with them, I think, is another interesting question and, and how they interact with the world and have purpose and so forth, I think, is is, is another big you know question mark that's sitting out there because those people aren't just going to disappear. Right. You know, like, so uh, but they're probably not going to have a white picket fence either. Sure. You know, so. And so a lot of your work seems to be trying to provide answers to those kind of questions like what what do men do now? So what's. What's where do you stand at this point? I know for a while it was this idea like of you know you need a gang like the way of you know men is the way of the gang right, and so what does that mean for the modern man? Uh, it's so important, uh, you know. It's so important I think to all of us just for our mental health. Uh, I mean, I think the idea that you could, you know, in my life is like this. I have to I have to be careful about it. I have to be I have to actively go out and find people. Uh, to be around. That's one of the reasons why I moved. I moved close to my jiu-jitsu gym when I moved to Arizona, uh, because I'm like, well, that's the only place I'm going to talk to people. I'm, a, I'm an author. I, I work from home. Yeah. You know, I could I could not talk to somebody for days. Uh, and men need to interact with other men and have that experience. And that's how we define our masculinity. We, it doesn't come from women. It can't. Uh, our sense of ourselves comes from other men. So to begin with, for our own mental health outside of practical concerns and like the world falling apart and all kinds of other stuff for our own mental health. I think that men need, we become more confident if we know where we fit into a group of men mm -hmm. and we have guys that we can call and guys we can rely on it, because you know, the modern preference is obviously like, Oh, you just talk to your wife about all those things. And uh, you know, that's not really the best course of action for right. a lot of guys. Well, for any guys really, I mean, right. like there are things that you need to talk about with your male friends and not make your wife into your dude buddy. 
you know, like that's because a lot of guys do that. They, they, yeah, they try to solve the problem by like, uh, you know, making their wife into their bro. Right. And, uh, that's, that's not good either. I had to learn that a really hard way. Um, because like where I got my start, like my initial niche was, you know, I was a trained life coach, but, uh, I helped guys quit porn. That was like what my niche was. And so like the, the thing I had to learn like really quickly was like, Hey, you can't make your wife an accountability partner with quitting porn. Like that's like, if, as soon as you do that, like you have her looking over your shoulder or you're going to her when you're triggered, that's going to fuck the whole thing up. Like, you know, like <laughs> you need to have a group of men that you can talk to about this and have them support you. And it's from then, like since then I basically, I've been running, you know, men's groups since then, like almost like a mentoring call or two per week. And the, the growth and transformation I've seen from guys who are simply able to connect with other men and and actually like really talk about stuff like there's a lot of value to have social relationships with men you know I'm sure like you know jujitsu is awesome like having some lifting buddies or you know guys you go and you drink with that's that's really awesome but like where I think masculine relationships like uh, become the most valuable is when they go deeper right like where when you're actually able to like say hey i got this problem and you just like throw it out there and you can get you can hear from other men how to approach it or you've got like you just taking your your philosophy and you're just like i'm going to smash it in your philosophy and then we're going to see like what comes out and we're both going to be stronger from it would you agree with that that like you really need to try and seek out those masculine relationships where you can go beneath the superficial yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a huge benefit to that. And I see it with, I, I have friends, This there weren't a lot of these many years ago, right? Uh, but uh, now, I mean, I, I know all kinds of guys who are in all kinds of different groups. And uh, they, get, they definitely get something out of it. A really good friend of mine in uh, Salt Lake City, he was uh, in uh, Ryan Mickler's Order of Man, and he, he had his battle team. And he was, you know, they were always talking about what they needed to do and fixing their lives and all kinds of stuff. Uh, really good, p productive stuff. Um, and it is, if you can go beyond the superficial, that's 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 ideal. The the trick with men is because of the way they're organized a lot of times and the way they, their brains work, is that uh, you almost have to trick them into talking with each other about stuff. That's you almost better. need something superficial to like, or like give you an excuse to be together, right? It's like yeah, yeah. I mean that's what like uh, I mean I, uh, it's funny I'm bringing up Lionel Tiger twice, but uh, uh, when he wrote about male bonding and what it does is that men need to aggress against something. It doesn't matter what mm. it is. If they're, they'll aggress against something together, and then while they're doing that, they'll talk about whatever they need to. Uh, but and that's the thing: you invite somebody out to build something, and you're really talking about all kinds of other stuff, but you're building a thing, right? And uh, you know, I've I've done that before. You know, you have a whole conversation during that day. Uh, you know, people always say that men don't talk, but actually, if you get them doing something, they it's hard to get them to shut up, right? Uh, you know, like a lot of them will really talk about their lives right away because they've been waiting, they've been waiting for a guy right. to talk to, but they don't want to do it in a little circle necessarily, and just like here, and they don't want to do it at the office, here. like with the girls around yeah. either. No, no, that's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, that, that yeah, would work. Need a, they need a space where they can, they have guys that they can trust and they've interacted with and and whatever, and that's that's the you know like you know jiu-jitsu and stuff like that i mean like that's uh you know it's like okay well that guy's been strangling me for six months and uh and so <laughs> that guy's been trying to kill me for six months uh a lot of times in between you, you'll work with a partner and you'll be like i mean i was talking to one guy you know we were talking about real estate the other day like in between rolling you know like you're doing all kind you're talking about all kinds of other stuff or like uh one guy brought up king magician warrior lover oh it's nice like during class and I was like well you know I wrote I know a guy who wrote a better book than that and <laughs> and uh, so uh, now that guy's probably gonna go read my book you know like so yeah. there does things do you know evolve uh from from, from those kind of activities uh it's just it, what's good about these kind of groups that are like specifically for that is that you know kind of jump starts that because getting men who are comfortable to talk to each other and trust each other enough to go into sensitive information um because men are not tactically stupid and they're gonna if there's sensitive information that you can use against them they're not gonna like open that up to a stranger right, right. Uh, so they want to protect themselves a little bit and i think that that's natural and they men get a lot of shit for that but i mean i think that that's just tactically smart men think tactically like why would i tell a stranger something that can destroy me well i'm not gonna not i'm not gonna open with that 
you know, so I think that these groups that are specifically for that do have the advantage of jumping over that process of like <laughs> the year that it takes me to get to know you enough to tell you, you're like, oh, I, you know, I kind of have a problem with this. Right. Like, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, if you can, if you have a purpose to actually sit down and work on these things together, then, uh, you know, that can be you know very advantageous as long as they're, as long as it's not exploitative and there's, there's, you know, a good, good trust there. And because you can see, you can see stuff. Sometimes people do groups that like seem like Mike, you're just trying to get dudes to cry. And that's a different oh. thing. You know, yeah, like, no. I've seen a lot of that. And I'm like, oh, uh, like, yeah, that's that's there's something else is going on. There, you know? Yeah. But, uh, my, my take on like the, the that kind of deep inner work, there's like a place for it. But like for men, unless there's like some serious psychological damage, like some serious abuse in the past, men are, seem to be best served by continuing to drive forward. And you only go backward when you're blocked by something in your past. Like when you have to like, when there's some kind of limiting belief, like usually it's, for in my work, it's usually like um, uh, basically they can't get over the idea that they are only conditionally good. And so it's like whenever they have something that proves a conditional form of their own status, like they get rejected uh, by a woman or they um, you know, screw something up at work, they get this message of, oh, I'm not good enough. And as soon as they do that, they stop treating themselves well. Basically, they lose their justification for um, sacrificing for their own benefit. And when that happens, you know, all their, their work goes out the window. They go on some kind of like bender where they, you know, do porn, drugs, whatever. And they kind of throw, just seek to escape themselves because the mind is designed to like unite itself with what it defines as good and avoid what it defines as bad. So as soon as you define yourself as bad, boom, escape is a mode. And the way that I found like to, to deal with that is to like d dig into um, like what was that message that, that you got at what usually there's some big, you know, they call it the wound where some someone communicated to you that you were either inherently not good or conditionally not good. And that seems to be the thing where that's really the only time you really want to dig into the past and then you can process that and reframe that. But yeah, the whole like get guys together and do and a drum circle so we can all cry on each other. That, yeah. that doesn't seem to have any sort of value. Sorry. I went on a bit of a tangent there, but <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I agree. Yeah. So one of the things uh, that came up while I was reviewing your work was, you know, if we got, we need to get men in the groups, you know, we're, we're ultimately these tribal creatures. What about this objection that there's already enough tribalism in the world and that like encouraging this sort of mentality is actually counterproductive to creating a more cohesive society? Where we all live as one. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's never going to happen because uh, we're not wired for that because humans are tribal. Uh, and we see it anyway. I mean, you saw like uh, whatever, like over the past, you know, a couple years. And it's like it was all the tribes that we thought weren't there were like, you know, like vaccination tribe and, and uh, you know, like uh, mass tribe and, and uh, came up and people came up with all kinds of new reasons to hate each other. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and create in groups and out groups because that's what people do. And uh, and I think a lot of people were playing that to their advantage as well. Like, like, well, we'll just, you know, like you two fight, you know, like, uh, <laughs> let, 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 let's just, let's just uh, stir some shit up and make some people fight with each other. And that's been happening a lot. Um, so people are going to do that either way. Um, and yeah, you know, again, it, and it's also, a th is it bad to who? Like who who doesn't want men to get together into groups that, that are tribal? Because they will. Men will create a an in-group and an out-group. If once they have their club, um, you know, then it becomes everybody who's not like us is, is, is evil. <laughs> and right. everyone who's not like us just sucks. Right. Uh, and I've seen that happen with like, you can do that in a telegram group in like a month. Uh, yeah. You know, like, you, like you can get guys that like, you, they start to get their own jokes. And then like, these guys don't even, these guys don't even know what they're talking. We, we have our own way of doing things around here. Yeah. You know, and, and men do that all the time. And that's just in, to their na inherent to their nature. And yeah, you know, when you get, get guys together, they can become dangerous. Uh, you know, like they can be, you know, then that's, you know, like an argument that's used against it, but also... They can also create really good things then as well. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the guys too. You know, if you get, if you get a guys, a lot of guys who are like broken and aimless and like need a sense of purpose. And then you get one guy to give them a purpose. And then that's, that purpose is bad. 
uh, <laughs> you know, like is, is, then that's, that's how you start trouble. But if you yeah. have a lot of guys who are like pretty well rounded and they're pr pretty all right. And they, you know, they're productive guys and they want to be productive guys and they want to do better in life. Um, then you get them into a group of other guys who are like that and they just grow and they get better and better and better. So it's just a matter of like what kind of, again, it's like, you know, the quality of what you're working with. And uh, the solution is to not to never allow men to be in a space unsupervised, which seems to be like what society has wanted. You know, we had all these men's groups. Uh, you know, you think about the, you know, there was a kind of a renaissance of men's organizations, uh, you know, the turn of like, you know, I guess not last century, but the century before, like a, um, you know, going, in, going into the 1900s. You had this renaissance of you know they of course you know america you know started out with you know there were freemasons and whatever but you also had like the odd fellows and all these other right uh, you know like uh, the lions club and the, you know, all these other you know things that they made fun of flintstones with uh, the you know grand poobah and, and, right uh, and that kind of stuff i mean they've had so many men's groups and uh feminists like one by one went in and infiltrated them and shut them down or made the, it made them be integrated and uh because it was the old boys club was right. in there and that was where they made all the decisions and it's true because that those guys would be like the main guys in the town i mean if you look out at most of the small towns in america they were built by those organizations right you know, there's the lions club is the big building and they're you know like the last town i small town i lived in you know like you had the three main organizations all had big buildings downtown and now they were just you know some other thing right but yeah, uh you way. know the masonic lodge and this and that and uh, that is where all the guys from town got together and they sat in a room and had some beers and were like uh you know what do you want to do about this problem that we have over with uh, you know like whatever it is you know like whatever political issue that they were having in town yeah that's how things were getting done you know like and so women wanted access to that space and so in, in because it was an access to power and by, by infiltrating that, then it became less valuable to men as because it was no longer just a group of men. Right. And so then those groups died. You know, now they're like pretty much, I mean, my dad's a member of like Lions Club or something. Uh, one Elks, I think he's Elks. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, it's not the same. I mean, it's just a bunch of guys who go play darts and drink beer for like once a month. You know, it's, right. not, it's not what it was. Right. And you tell me if you get this sense as well, because my my feeling is that, the uh, the the feminists, the you know the hard lefties have kind of jumped the shark, particularly since COVID. And prior to that, um, you know, it started to shift a little bit with Donald Trump and everything. Um, but prior to that, it, it was very easy for the the rationally minded man to kind of put his head in the sand and just be like, oh, you know, it's progress. You know, it's you know, it's cool. You know, I'm all for like women working and doing everything like that. But now it's gotten to the point of such insanity, you know, especially now that it's like, you know, getting to the level of starting to like trying to normalize perverted stuff with kids, you know, like getting like kid drag shows and shit like that. Right. I'm I'm wondering if like there is going to be a bit of a hard line masculine conservative resurgence. And this is actually something that I was tweeting at you about um, online where it's like, you know, do you see the potential for a uh, a hard pushback for what we've been seeing in the mainstream? It just depends from where. I mean, I've I've been in subcultures all my life, <laughs> so like I, I've I've seen some things, yeah. and uh, so you know, like I, I you saw this push, you know, before the alt right. I mean, I was before it really became what it became. Um, I was involved with that and I was invited to, to participate and write some articles and so, so forth. And so I saw that kind of rise up and I saw these guys got super overconfident, like, oh, we're, we're, we are memeing the president into the White House. You know, like we, they, they thought that they were controlling the world for memes. And, uh, you know, you really had these groups of guys who were thinking we're doing that. And uh, I see I feel like I'm seeing the same thing right now because there's this big reaction. In many ways, that was a reaction to Obama being in office for four years and, and uh you know the policies that were coming in and 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 so forth and then uh then you have you know right now you have the insanity that you mentioned you know like like they're literally grooming kids you know like it's it's not that's not okay no. most gay people didn't think it was okay they, they would have said that that's horrible like years ago yeah um and uh and so it's it, it, like you said it's jumped the shark and it's gotten really insane to the point where a lot of people were like nope 
And uh, so a lot of people were really angry and they're looking for something to go back to, which I really don't think you can do that. Yeah. But uh, they do need some th- some choices need to be made and some things need to be stopped. And uh, and you know, it's just a matter of how big of a push and where that's going to come from and how much staying power it's going to have or whether they're going to do what we you know, I saw the already do, which is basically like overestimate how much influence and power that they have. Yeah. You know, like I see I see it happening right now a little bit with like there's kind of a there, there's like kind of a big Christian resurgence like that's happening. Um, and uh, because that's where I think the money and the organization is coming from. And there was a big pushback from that f- against the uh, vaccines and so forth. Yeah. Um, that's where a lot of that money and everything was coming from. And a lot of the organization and so forth. And now that's kind of like gained some steam and you have like things like the, wi- the Daily Wire and, and some some bigger outlets that are like have some influence and power like turning point and all that kind of stuff right and a lot of that's coming from christianity and so i think there are a lot of people who think that like yes they were going to do a reconquista with like christianity and uh yeah. uh i i don't think that that's the numbers are really there for that um i do think that yeah there are a lot of people going to start drawing some hard lines and i think they should yeah uh some hard lines about what's acceptable what's not acceptable and we're not gonna okay with this anymore and I think that's a, we need to have those conversations, and that's that's important to do. But whether you know, it's we're, there's going to be a hard right. I mean, that's like a fantasy of the left almost that like there's going to be like this uh, Christian Reconquista, or there's going to be this like uh, you know, everybody thinks everybody wants to say fascists, even though fascists are technically what's running us right now. Right. But uh, you know, like everyone wants to say like you know, well, Hitler's coming back or whatever, and Hitler's definitely not coming back. Uh, there's no there's no will for that. If you look at like regular people in country i mean it was hard to see from utah but like when i came down here to arizona and i'm i'm in the suburbs i'm in like you know i'm in i'm in red country out here you know i'm in the suburbs i mean it's a pretty conservative area but you know it's dudes with tattoos and like like, people are trying to look good people like it's it's not the 50s (laughs) you know know, there's they're living in it they're not living in that world and they're not going back to it right so like there's there whereas yeah, there is a push of like, hey, this is too far. Like, uh, and I think that, I think that is a discussion to have. And unfortunately, what you had for so long was my, you know, these kind of sexual minority groups and uh, you know, like uh, feminists for, for a long time. It's like you couldn't criticize them. And right. they were beyond criticism. So whatever they said, and this is what we're seeing right now, but I think that it's re- now when you go after kids, now all of a sudden, well, hey, you know, now mom's involved. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and so there's that, and uh, but and, when you and you've just been training mom to be a like you know stand up for herself and you know be a strong woman yeah. for the past you know however many decades. So now you got <laughs> militant yeah, moms. Yeah. Now you got tiger mom or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and so I think now you, know, you don't mess with people's kids. That's a different thing. Uh, people are obviously very sensitive about that, and uh, so I think that that's where the line is going to be. Uh, you know, because they're trying to be like, well, you can't criticize us and you're hurting people by criticizing us. And that worked for a long time. But I don't think it's going to work when it comes to somebody doing talking about sexuality with your fucking five year old. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that that's I think that America is not OK with that. And, uh, and for good reasons. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Like, it's uh, it's really crazy where the where, where the discourse has gone today, like how far things have like progressed in terms of like the insanity. And um, it always comes back to, uh, to me, it comes back to this book I read is called, um, uh, what was it called? The crap, the, the silence of Adam. That's what it was. And it was this book that had the fundamental, it said the fundamental failing of any man or I guess like of, of Adam, you know, the fall of man was that he did not speak up. And that's like the, the big issue is that for so long, so many guys were afraid to speak out, to disagree. And ever since like basically Trump made it okay to say, Hey, screw you. I disagree with you. Um, it seems like there has been a bit of a turning point, but you know, to where it can go, I have no idea. Like the way it like seems to me is that like, because of the internet, it's so easy to like live almost in a different place uh, virtually. 
right? So it's like we can create these like virtual tribes. Like you can tune into your your daily wire or whatever um, in the evening while living in you know the heart of like a blue county. Now, COVID went and shook that all up quite a bit. So I. I'm, I don't really know what the heck is going to happen. I think like it's going to be something rather unprecedented because of like the technology is unprecedented. The, the level of connectivity is unprecedented. But the, the thing that seems to me that's like most important is for men being willing to speak up, to tell the truth as much as they can. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's not always easy with like the the censorship culture. You know, you might worry about like you know losing your job. Like it's easy for you and me since we employ ourselves and that sort of thing. But um, right. for the average guy, it's rather tough. What do you think that guy should do? Like like how? What's? What do you think like to save the world? Like you know, we have a very bleak picture that we're moving toward that I think everyone can imagine. But if we were going to try and tip things toward the better. What can guys do? Well, I think, you know, you brought up a good point with the, the silence of Adam or whatever. And uh, that is a don't be complacent because uh, yeah. that's as you said, for so many years, men were allowed to a, able to just focus on their own business and ignore everything and, uh, you know, kind of put their head in the sand and like, oh, this isn't happening in my neighborhood. So it's not coming. <laughs> Right. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why I think I was ahead of a lot of things is I, I went to school in New York City and and uh, studied, you know, class, classes. They were cooking up this gender theory stuff in like 1990s, mm. you know, like that's that was already there then. And I, I knew it was coming. But a lot of people, you know, talk to a regular guy who's, you know, grown up doing manual labor all his life. And he's like, what are you talking about? You know, and uh, so now it's right here and everybody can see it. And I think the challenge is to not be distracted by the issue of the day. I mean, uh, you know, it's like we saw all this horrible stuff happen over the past like two years, things that I would never thought that I would see in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, And people were really mad and then they throw a distraction issue at them and they get sidetracked. I'm like, don't forget what they did. Right. (laughs) Like, don't forget that you weren't allowed to leave your house for no reason. (laughs) Like, 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 hold on. Keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> That's know, why like, we need like, leaders. Like, There's no way yeah. to do this without without like, like, like. So there is going to need to be some good men who go against their natures and get into politics. Otherwise, I think we're totally fucked. Like there's going to have to be that reluctant guy, like the, you know, like gladiator. He just like wanted to be a farmer and he's like, ah, shit, I got to go back to war. Right. And it's like, that's, that's, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's what he wanted to do. Right. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I feel like we need, but I I think more more than that, like before that, not more than that, but before that is that we got to have a clearly articulated why. Like why why fight this? Because like, you know, in your book The Way of Men, you talk about bonobos versus chimpanzees, right? right. Chimpanzees are the the patriarchal society, you know, it's um, you know, dominated by males, then we've got the the bonobos which are the the, the, the matriarchy, right? So why should we go the way of the chimpanzee? Isn't the bonobo, you know, more peaceful? Doesn't, uh, isn't it nice to, you know, jerk off all day and, you know, kind of relax and not have to like worry about things? Right. Well, I mean, yeah, I think that, yeah, it's a question people have to ask themselves. It's like, what kind of life do I want? And uh, it is is the life of just laying on your back and just doing nothing. Are you even alive at that point? You know, like that's, you know, like, are you really doing anything? I mean, I think and there's a lot of people who that would be fine mm-hmm. and they want to be slaves. And, right. uh, you know, I just wish that they wouldn't make me a slave by wanting to be slaves. Like, that's the, that's the problem. Uh, you know, like okay, if you guys want to be slaves, I guess that's your prerogative. Go and do that. But, uh, you know, like the problem is that then that that puts it on the rest of us as well. And, uh, you know, I, I like having free will and the opportunity to, to, you know, better my situation or fail at my situation, you know, like, uh, you know, the idea of like having no money or whatever, you know, it will just be provided for. Mm. Um, I think that people really need to look at what being provided for would mean, uh, because someone gets to control what that means at that point. You've already given up all of your free will and all of your 
uh, say in every, every everything. So um, who's to say what you need? Not right. you. Uh, you know, so if what, you know, like, because once, once you've already given away that power, then, you know, people will think, people think that they'll just get what they're having now. And that's, that's not how that works. Uh, you know, it could be like, well, you don't need to have, you know, and some of it might be good. Like, I don't need to have four or five energy drinks a day. Uh, you know, that, that wouldn't be in my rations because I don't need that. But, uh, and, and so, you know, that, that would be a thing. But like, also maybe I only need about 40 grams of protein a day and instead of whatever 300 that I'm eating now. Right. Uh, you know, like, because that would be wasteful. And so you don't get to do that. Uh, right. And so like, they would, I mean, it really means a rationing out of everything. And, yeah. And, and decided by someone else. So all the thing people think that, you know, like, oh, I'd be like, just like eating whatever I want and playing video games all day and, and uh, jerking off and whatever, you know, having sex with the person in the pod down the hall, you know, like whatever. But right. uh, that's, why would you think that they would allow that? <laughs> like, like yeah. you know, who's going to work so that you can have those things? Exactly. And I think that that's, and I think that that's where we really need to, you know, I've looked at this a lot as to, you know, it, it, it is a bleak looking situation that we have right now in America. But, um, you know, I'm like, well, where's the middle way and where's the, the way that makes the most sense? And I think that, you know, for and where, what's most people going to buy into? And I think that I still think that, like, the founding principles of America are pretty, like, good. And you know, I think we can get a lot of people on board with those. You know, like, but if you start like getting into like more extreme stuff, then a lot of people are going to back out like, OK, well, if you want to have a Christian theocracy, I'm not going to help. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I'm not going to help. I'm not on your team now. Right. And uh, and so then there's a lot of people who are not going to. There are a lot of people who had bad, bad experiences. I, I, I really didn't. But like there are a lot of people who had bad, bad experiences with the you know, summer camp or whatever that they went to. Right. And they're never going to sign up for that. Of course. And, yeah. uh, and, and so, and, and the same thing, it's like, but if you want to be like, Hey, I want you to mind your own fucking business and I'll mind my own fucking business. You don't get to do, tell me what to do. I feel like that Americans will fight for that more than they will fight for, you know, like a, you know, I, I don't think we can come together on a lot of these like more extreme positions. Right. And I think it's... that even when, you know, I've talked to so many of the, uh, the people who would really do the fighting or whatever, uh, or who have the a lot of the other skills that really are required for all this. Uh, I mean, I've been lucky enough to talk to a lot of special forces guys over the years, and the ones who are not Dan Crenshaw, uh, you know, the ones who don't just become like bots. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of them are pretty deeply committed to that. Uh, the idea that you know people should be able to do what they want. Yeah. And uh, and, and they're pretty deeply committed to freedom, and a lot of them are also you know they've done some crazy stuff and seen some crazy things and they're not, you know, they're weird outsiders <laughs> to a certain extent. They're not, uh, uh, you know, they're like not mom and pa next door, you know? So there there's, I think that, but a lot of those guys, what they're going to get on board with is, is, you know, that, you know, like they do believe in the founding principle of America. They do care about it. And uh, that's, I think that that's, if we can put the brakes on controlling each other, because uh, that's what really what it is, whether, whether it's the left controlling us or the right controlling us, it's still about control. And I think that if we can move away from that and realize that being controlled is probably a lot of the problem. I mean, you always have to make some sacrifice to live in a world with roads. Uh, but you know, like, <laughs> there are things that you have to do to pay the police and, and whatever. But, you know, there's a middle way there. And whereas, you know, we get the maximum amount, amount of freedom and the minimal amount of government telling us what to do. And, yeah, uh, you know, like it's it's, it's, a, it's a hard to find balance, and it's not like it stays. Everything is a paradox in that way. Like you know, anything that's really wise is a paradox. You know, between two things, it's a, the, here are these things that really don't work together at all. Like order and freedom, <laughs> like don't really work together at all. But like finding the happy space in between them is where life is good. Right, and, and that's and so like that's good, the trick. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think you make a, a really good point that like coming back to like what America was founded on is kind of the, the key. Like you have um, the like it was like we went through this weird cycle. It's like, you know, 
prior to modern times, it was like the, you know, I'm talking like, you know, earlier 1900s and whatnot, you had the, the Christian narrative was oppressively dominant. Like you, you couldn't really question it. And, right. you know, they would just say shit and just spout it off like this is the way it is and, you know, couldn't like hear any critique of it. And so they got fat and lazy intellectually and the left, um, they, they really sharpened their chops. They built these, you know, very powerful philosophical frameworks like the, the whole deconstructionist sort of uh, idea, which, you know, has led to then this massive swing in the opposite direction. But now I'm seeing they're getting fat and lazy. It's just listen to me because you, you're a sexist if you don't. And the the conservative side has been sharpening their chops, and you know you see the kind of the rise of that with the Daily Wire, and you know those those like the the smart conservative who is also more media savvy, and it seems like where things go bad is if, like you said, it goes toward this path of like okay, now we're going to have this religious theocracy. Um, the only way I see it saving is if like the the conservative side like decides to not just end up back on top but instead seeks to find that liberalism, like that true kind of liberal, like, you know, the classical liberal that's like yeah. now conservative, apparently, yeah. <laughs> like because they believe in rationality um, and logic because yeah. Yeah, logic is now apparently sexist right. or racist or whatever yeah. it is. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> is it, yeah, it probably is. Um, <laughs> It's like, that's got to be it. You know, that's, and ultimately, I think that is the Christian standpoint. Like if we, you know, you worship Jesus, who's supposed to be the logos, the intellectual like word, the rationality. It's like, if we bring the focus back to that, which is what the the founding fathers, I don't know, the best system that seems to have been created so far, like what we can do is we can create that tension that keeps everything kind of snapped from spiraling off into some sort of disordered chaos because there needs to be that polarity between the conservative and the liberal side of like things. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to happen if there's a pettiness that just wants to get revenge. And I definitely see a chunk of that on the conservative side and it's, I, I it's not going to work out. No. And it's going to alienate their allies. Yeah. Uh, that, and that's, that's the, what they don't see is that like, a, you know, I'm kind of, you know, having watched all this, you know, a few cycles now, uh, you know, I see, I do see that I, I always call it, there's almost like Christian Satanism that's happening right now. And I mean it in the Satanism in, in terms like of do like it, do I it with thou wilt kind of thing. Like, op, no, like oppositional for just for the sake of being oppositional. Ah, like we, what, like we're, we're, we just want to win and we're vengeful and we want to hurt other people. And uh, we're just mm. going to like put a cross on it. You know, like uh, the people who were turned the cross upside down and were heavy metal before, uh, now the you know cross is already upside down. That's already mainstream. So now right. they're turning it back up, but for the same reason. Uh, you know, like because they're just being oppositional for the sake of being oppositional rather than right. actually seeking good. And uh, you know, which is, there are all kinds of obviously there. And I think that's a lot of new guys who are like just like they want to do Christianity because they're mad at blue haired people rather than like actually, mm. Christianity, you know, and because obviously there are plenty of sincere Christians and I'm friends with a lot of them and whatever. And, and that's, that's a different thing. And I think that, yeah, if it just becomes petty and vengeful, that that'll be bad. And also, you know, I, a lot of people and a lot of people who are really at the highest levels of influence, uh, you know, like once the boomers die, um, you know, like that's, or as they, as they go into retirement homes and whatever is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that still remember the nineties. And uh, like when, you know, the Bush, the first Bush era and the second Bush era where evangelicals had their like thumb on the White House and like were like really like operating on all this stuff. And um, and and we're doing a lot of things that were too far. And, uh, you know, like things that aren't really even on the table anymore. But like back then, we're like an actual concern. Like what? And uh, well, you're all the, you know, and there were all the, you know, like basically scandals and corruption, like all the 700 club stuff and all that. There was a lot of that going mm -hmm. on for a long time. And that fuels the left a lot because there's a lot of, you know, like 50 year old lesbians or whatever who were like, who remember when, you know, Bush era and the televangelists and all this stuff. And, and, uh, you know, Bush was trying to create a Jesus landing pad in like uh, Israel. And that's why we have to go to war and all this other stuff that was like, you know, there's a big, you know, 
there's a sense of not wanting to go back to that, I think, for a lot of regular people. Yeah. Not just the blue haired lesbian, but the, it's just like regular people who remember that. And they're like, that was too far. I mean, because there was a big reaction for that. Obviously, there, there was AIDS. Um, so that era, and, that were, and so there was big. That's when they were actually talking about putting gays in camps and stuff like that, which, yeah. you know, like if you see that, that's part of the narrative now because these people are still traumatized from it. You know, because no one, like Trump never said anything like that. Dude, party is doing before. Right? You know, but uh, he never said anything like that and never would have, that wasn't even on his radar. Uh, but, you know, there were all these people who thought the first time they get power, that's what they're going to do. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, most Christians, most normal people, no, they didn't, they don't want that. That's not where they're at. You know, and, and so like, uh, you know, I, I think there's a sense of like, well, if you guys are going to go that way, then that's too far. Yes. But if, if you, if you're ready to, if you just want to like, you know, be free to do your religion, do mine, we, like get back to that place. I think that we can, I think there's some kind of sensible middle there. There's got, I mean, we've had it before. It's like, you know, you, yeah. you do what you want and we do what we want. Like that's what true Christianity is about. It's not about creating a political sort of thing. It's definitely been that in the past, but you know, that's not, you know, what Jesus taught or whatever, but like, he's like, you know, give to Caesar what's his, right? He wasn't saying go do that kind of shit. So it's like, you know, religion is always getting co-opted, obviously. Um, and sure. I'll, I'll actually want to get into that more in a second here. But you brought up something that was interesting to me. Like you're talking about like uh, the, you know, you got a lot of, you know, 50 year old lesbians and stuff who are, you know, don't want to go back to that. But I'm, I'm curious, this is something that I've kind of wonder about. So, you know, you're a gay man and a lot of like the gay culture has, from what I understand, it's, it's very like obsessed with masculinity or at least part of gay culture is like, it's like, you know, you have like this hype, right. Hyper, hyper masculine guys. Like, but, but, yeah, yeah. but then like you have like the whole LGBTQ AI PQ, I don't know what the rest of it is. And like, they are extremely hostile. It seems like to masculinity, unless it's a, you know, biological female acting it out. And so I'm wondering if, have you noticed a schism between like the traditional gay guys and you know this this alphabet soup type thing well i think you're seeing it now and i guess for the same reasons i think there are, i mean there's a group on uh the instagram and twitter i think it was banned recently uh called gays against groomers uh, <laughs> you know there were a whole bunch of people that were like no too far <laughs> you know like get out of get drag queens out of kids classes that's not okay uh especially uh, frankly if you've been around drag queens you know that that's not okay uh, like I've, I've been around enough drag queens in my life to know that they're a little messed up and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, they shouldn't be around kids ever. Uh, but you know, that's, that's, you know, another thing, but I think that, and I'm not really part of that community. I don't really keep tabs on what they do at all. It's not part of my life, but, um, they, yeah, I do think, I think there was a thing that happened right after kind of AIDS in the 90, early 90s that uh, I think you lost a lot of your brain trust of dudes because uh, they died. Uh, mm. You know, a lot of the guys who were running the game open at that time um, died. And, mm. uh, and so, you know, like, and there was a big thing about obviously being shamed and people were, because people were dying, you know, like and there was, yeah. that was a whole thing. And then I think that uh, a lot of, you know, females kind of swept into like, we're going to run things now, mm. uh, you know, as how, how the, this is, how the politics goes and what the ideologies are and whatever. And I think that that was just kind of accepted. And, uh, you know, the, the, unfortunately gays have a thing, um, because they feel like that they were outcasts in some way. Um, they don't like to outcast people. Um, so they, they don't like to judge people because they've been judged. Sure. You know, yeah. so. Which is in many ways an admirable thing. Psychology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're trying to be consistent and, and they, they're like, well, I, cause that's, it, they look at, it comes back right back on them. Like, well, someone said that I was a horrible person and whatever. And so how can I go and say that to this other person who's different from me? Right. And so they have that mentality. And I mean, there is some good to be said for that. And it seems reasonable and like a nice person, but also like, you know, order is about boundaries. And, uh, you know, like you can't, if you just have no boundaries, you have complete disorder and chaos. 
and uh, you know you can cro- you can change a boundary, you can change a rule without changing all the other ones. <laughs> you know, like that's then that's the the problem that they ran into is that they couldn't say no, and that was obviously you know I think that relates to what happened to most men in America is that they couldn't say well this is fine you know like you know, but but that's enough <laughs> like that that's right. too far, and I think that now you are seeing a little bit more of that because. I mean, for people who you know, are old enough, and myself would be included, um, like, I've always like, I don't want to be anywhere near kids. I would never want anyone to think that, um, you know, because that that's what people used to say about gay guys, mm. you know, that they were all trying to get at your kids. Mm. And that is not true. That's not the, that's a different psychology, whatever is going on with dudes who want to do that. Right. And uh, and so but now you have this all this shit happening and then you have the conservatives saying, well, look, we said we screaming about this years ago and now it's coming true. You called us crazy. Yeah, it looks like it's true. (laughs) And I'm like, they're 90 percent of gay news. They don't want to be they they want nothing. They'll go to the bar so they don't have to be around children at the restaurant. Like they don't want, you know, like they don't want to do anything with their kids, uh, which is the worst thing I could possibly imagine. You know, and so. I think that that's, you know, I think that people should be scared about that a little bit about like being associated with that. Um, Because I wouldn't, you know, like as soon as I started to see this happening, I was like, oh, that's bad. That's going to be really bad for a lot of people who are decent. And that's that's Uh, the thing is like we got to like lumped in with like, yeah. Yeah, they're going to get lumped in with people who are like, you know, really trying to harm children. And that's not that's not cool. And that's the problem when you worship tolerance right because like it's like oh well these these people they have pedophilia or what do they call it like they have a, a some minor kind of pe- attracted or minor whatever. attracted yeah they're minor attracted and it's like <laughs> yeah. at a certain point you have to be intolerant or else like it's going to go fucking yeah. nuts like you have like i want to live in a world where you are terrified of letting people know that you have attraction to little kids. Like I want you to not be yeah. able to like speak about that openly. Like there was some like philosopher from some freaking um, university who was like making, like trying to make all these like, you know, deep arguments as to why it's okay to like, you know, uh, be attracted to little kids and you know, there's nothing like wrong with it or whatever. And it's like, I want to live in a society where a man is terrified to do that. You know, I don't want to live in a society where yeah. like, Oh, you kill that guy. But like, where there is a general moral culture that has zero tolerance for that level of bullshit. And like that's that's where like this this embrace of effeminacy I think has yeah. really screwed us because there's there's that lack of um oh that's a bad thing I need to fucking kill it. That's just been lost. And because we're just right. we're so arms wide open. Come here baby. It's okay. It's all right. I accept yeah, you. Yeah. And like eventually it's all just going to go into chaos and the person who's just most conniving or powerful is going to run it. And uh, there's not going to be any sort of like order or value that people can, you know, scale and live a proper life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that's, it, yeah, it, it, there used to be a thing where like, okay, well, we have a problem and we'll try to help you fix it. Mm. Uh, you know, where like, because, which is the correct way to handle that, you know, like, okay, yes. like, Someone's having some weird fucking thoughts about kids. He, he needs to go talk to somebody. And yeah. He, he, if he, need, he needs to like be in a program and needs to work that out or, you know, we need to figure out what's going on there that's making that happen. And it is hard. I mean, that, sexuality is a hard thing to change. Uh, whatever, when, whatever screw got loose, it might stay loose. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and that's so, okay. Like, like people can like be built that way, but at the same time, there shouldn't be like, there shouldn't be like a freaking Nambla that's allowed to like, you know, exist yeah. and, and assemble. Yeah, no, it's like, all. where is, where is the, where is the, t- like the seeing some of that stuff? I forget what it was. It might've been the cuties um, trailer or something along those. It was something like, you know, gross like that. I like felt, and I don't know if I've ever felt like the torch and pitchfork, like instinct so strong. I was like, Oh, I get why people like went and like went crazy. They would like burn people down. Like the, the where yeah. is that? Like, revulsion instinct it seems like we've been so inundated with like craziness that it's just like it's gotten deadened inside of people and we're just like ah oh, yeah and they just like you know scroll to the next thing <laughs> uh, I, I mean i think that there i think it's there with a lot of guys i mean i think 
there are a lot. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I have a a, a curated feed, <laughs> so like, I, what I see is not what maybe what other people see all yeah. the time. I mean, I I see you know tons of memes of dudes saying you know well, we should be able to kill these people, but <laughs> it's uh, it, that's you know, not the majority. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think that I do think the majority is like absolutely not. That's not acceptable um, yeah. because I think they do know that that's because I mean just logically it's really really damaging for kids i mean it's yeah. like it's like it's you know and this has become an issue like someone compared it to this and gotten a lot of trouble recently but it's true like if you're i mean that's you're you're creating a, a a trauma in their youth that it may they may never fix and and that's yeah, or they may have to be a lot of therapy to fix yeah and uh you know and you're creating some really really bad things some scars for no reason uh, that they shouldn't be subjected to that. And, uh, you know, that's, it's really unfortunate. And you, yeah, I see people, I know people who've had stuff like that happen to them and they're messed up for decades, Yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, and that's, you know, like, and they, they may, you know, I know some people who have been pretty successful and gotten through that kind of stuff and, and talk about it. But like, you know, if people who've had bad things happen to them as kids like that, that they, they get, they get that becomes up. a journey that they have to go on or else they're kind of fucked. It's just like, yeah. You know. And so like the idea that we would be able to be okay with that, like you, you, you're hurting that kid a lot and, and creating a really messed up adult. And uh, like, we need to be able to have a conversation and be like, that's not okay. And I don't care what's going on in your head, but it needs to be stay in your head. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things we tell people. I mean, it's kind of hilarious, right? If you think about it, all the stuff that we've been talking about, like, on one hand, you have people telling us that we're supposed to stop being masculine and just evolve past being, uh, you know, like normal men. And they're just saying that these poor people can't change. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they I can't know. change that they want to touch kids. You know, like, uh, like but we're supposed to, like, just stop it's being true. men. But they're, they're, they, they can't possibly be, stop wanting to touch kids. It's, it, that's, that's the insanity of that. What's most interesting, though, uh, <laughs> is that, like, while they're completely unable to define what a woman is, they're really good at pinpointing all the bad parts of being a man. Uh. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. All the, all the toxicities. Yes. Um, okay, so I want to pivot here a little bit and talk about your new book, Fire in the Dark. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I was uh, sadly not able to, to, to finish it because I just had some stuff uh, come up before our uh, talk here, but I managed to start getting into it. It seems like what you're trying to do is create uh, like a, a mythological framework, like a, you know, maybe religion like type religion type technology like i set up stories principles and values mm -hmm. to like help men orient themselves and you're calling it solar idealism is that an accurate representation yeah 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 and, and i i'm really kind of digging back into this yeah i think after writing a book i get a little exhausted and i probably should have been like out with a hammer on that one right away but i got involved in some other things and uh, so now I'm kind of coming back to this because I think it, it is a smart thing to say and I think it's a good idea uh, in terms of, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people who were raised Christian. They're always going to be Christian. And there's people who were, you know, all different religions and they're raised that way and they're always going to be that way. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people who aren't any of those things. And uh, and so. I can see we can sit in history I and mean, I've done various other things. And I, I came to this when I started talking about this book because I was out uh, practicing Germanic paganism. And so I knew a lot about the stories and so forth, the you know old Norse stories and, and uh, uh, the Eddas and sagas and so forth. And you know, I was going to write a book called Odin Thor Frey that was around, around Germanic paganism. But I came to a place where I was like, well, once you study this stuff deep enough and you know enough about it, you know that you know, it, it, it's really not fixed yeah. in the, in terms of like what those people were worshiping at that, that particular time probably changed from tribe to tribe. And uh, we just have a version of it that came actually because Christians trans, you know, wrote down the stories like 200 years after they were kind of outlawed. Uh, and uh, so we have this kind of like fairy tale version of it that came from like, you know, that was passed down. Uh, through Christians who preserved it for us. And so, and a lot of history is like that. 
you know, like a lot of religions are like that, whether it's, you know, like, uh, you know, there's so many different forms of Buddhism. Uh, my sure. friend who's really interested in those. And uh, when you look at the ancient Greek world, well, what did they believe in Athens versus what they believed in Sparta? And, you know, like, and so like you see things change all the time in, in society. And it very much, I kind of went back to the roots of what I talked about in the way of men. Well, like what's always true? Right. In a way is what is always masculine, what is always, you know, feminine. Uh, what is, you know, what is always true as far as mythological systems? What stories do we keep telling over and over again? Yeah. And you could relate it to obviously like, you know, Hero with a Thousand Faces, the Joseph Campbell stuff. Uh, right. I read, you know, King Warrior, Magician Lover. They did a version of kind of what I'm doing as well. Uh, but I looked at it in a, in a three part system and I was like, well, what looks, you know, I was looking at Odin Thor Frey originally, but then it's like, well, there's not just those guys. There's, you know, there's always a father in the sky. Yeah. You know, like that's pretty much pretty common to almost every religion ever. And well, why? Like, like, well, why do we always have that? You know, hmm. and so like I and and so you know, I, I talk about like, well, why? Why do you think that, you know, like your father is someone you look up to, but you can't ever be him. He, you, there's an idea of your father that's beyond your father. Hmm. Uh, it's the perfect idea of what a father is and uh, therefore a perfect idea of what a man is and 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 so like you know like it makes sense that uh, where is he oh he's up there even further than my dad uh right. you know he's in the sky and that's uh, i mean and there's a lot of other reasons obviously that's very simple so that would be the, the odin obvious. side right yeah okay yeah, yeah yeah but also you know it becomes then zeus and all these other people you know, sure like, right it, it, like the, the father names, the father's the side yeah the father's side and okay. uh, and so that's the, the father, and and uh, then I talk about the the, the striker, which ten, there always tends to be a warrior storm, storm god. Yeah, there's always like a, a warrior with thunder and lightning, and and that's it's really the fire of heaven. It's really like when heaven gets angry, right? And that's that's to, to defect good to protect good, they send down the the lightning, and uh, those are the heroes and the warriors and all, all that. And then you know obviously you have Thor, but also in the ancient in the Vedic tradition you had Indra who also had lightning bolts zeus had lightning bolts and and what happens with strikers is that like you know how you have a lot of them but usually the king or the father eventually is an ascended striker like he went out and killed something and started the world as i like to say and uh you know and then he creates a whole world around him uh because he he, he killed the monster and made the safe uh, created the safe space and uh and that's what uh you know, oh, you know zeus had to you know kill a monster to you know start the olympians uh and uh and obviously odin had to kill emir the uh, you know, the giant and uh make the whole world from him from hmm. his corpse and and uh this is just a thing that you know like uh, indra had to kill Virtra, the uh the uh, this dragon that kept all the water in he was keeping the water away from the people and it's always it's always like a serpent thing that they have to kill Hmm. which kind of symbolizes this chaos and death and it comes from the earth and hides in the shadows and all that. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's these themes yeah. come again and again and again and again. And so I'm like, well, let's, if you're not invested in a particular system, let's stand back from this weird place we're in history because most of history, we've been in this place where you only really knew what was going on for maybe like 50 miles from your house. You know, like that's most of human history. You know, 50 miles is generous. You know, like you really didn't know what was going on in the world beyond a certain realm. And so, you know, as you know, we got books and so forth and writing and as as time went on, you, you did have people who knew more about society, but most people still didn't. You know, most people weren't literate uh, for most of human history. It was just a few people who were literate. And, uh, you know, so we're at this place where we can pick up our phones and look at all of human history at once. Right. And see whatever we want to find out. Like what and I can so I can see like the way the runes came from probably like some, you know, like Etruscan stuff and whatever. And, and uh, they came they, they came up from the Phoenicians, probably. And you can see this because, you know, archaeologists never have traced all this stuff like this came from this and this came from that. And, like, and this was repeated over and over again. And this is just, right. just these like the gods of Mesopotamia kept giving having the same story and giving new names. Uh, so really hard to keep tabs on like who are we talking about again but you know like it's just as new kingdoms came in they just renamed the gods and uh so we've seen this happen over and over again so i think you know i, I think the gods that i talk about the you know the archetypes that i talk about the the father striker the lord of the earth uh they are related to i think aspects of masculinity uh that 
you know, they're the jobs that we've always had to do. You know, like we've always had to create order and become leaders and, and uh, you know, like uh, separate one thing from another thing, as we were talking about earlier. And we've always had to, you know, you know, the striker is the kind of the way of men's side of it. You know, like you know, this, they keep making sure the perimeter is safe and and, and uh, worrying about all that. And then there's the Lord of the Earth thing. Well, what do you do when you have the safe perimeter? It's like, well, that's where all the life and the art and the fecundity and everything uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you embed in nature to your will to make it nice? I mean, because we did. We People... We forget that men build all the beautiful things in the world, right? <laughs> like, yeah, there, there's a big thing about that. Like, uh, men tend to when we get, in, especially in this masculinity space, because we're in such an effeminate society, we'd be like, you know, we have to go back to first principles and like go back to the striker stuff and go back to uh, warrior stuff. But also, you know, men build every beautiful building that's ever been built, pretty much, you know, up until like the last century. Uh, you know, like every beautiful thing, whether it's a pyramid or the Parthenon or you know anything. Uh, all the great cathedrals of Europe, men wanted to make beautiful things out of their world. And uh, that was, that's also what we do. And so like that's, I, you know, so those are three different archetypes that kind of describe, I think, the things that men do in the world. And so I kind of said, you know, like this is a, a lot of our God stories relate to just perfect versions of ourselves. Like perfect right. visions of like what I do and what I, what my challenges are. If I were the best possible version of myself, how would I handle those challenges? And that's what the gods do. Uh, you know, like they have, you know, if I was impossibly strong, I could, you know, like solve a problem like Hercules or, uh, you know, like, a, or, 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 you know, one of the gods, I could kill the dragon in, in the metaphor, whereas the stuff we have to deal with in real life, you know, it's like we, we can live in a poetic world, too. I mean, uh, we live in a, we can, the world can be as poetic as we want it to be. Uh, and we also we like to think of it in very dry terms, but uh, you know it's always the job of men to create order out of chaos. And you know, we really have storybook, uh, comic book uh, villains in the world right now. It's <laughs> like, very true. We are living in a comic book. <laughs> like like we have we have evil millionaires that are trying to like people, trying to like yeah like Klaus Schwab's food. types and everything. <laughs> oh yeah, it's freaking nuts. Yeah, I know. Oh no, yeah, we're gonna make yeah, you eat I mean, bugs, and you're gonna love it. <laughs> Yeah, like there are like <laughs> literal Bond movie supervillains like out there, uh, you know, out in the world. You have you know like a lot of people that like are on TV just look like they're in Hunger Games, you know. Mm. Like uh, they're, they're, we live in a strange world where it's like you can kind of see where all these these tales came from, you know. Right. Like uh, you know, it's, uh, these people are all like creating chaos for us, and we're trying to find order within it. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm, thanks for giving me the kind of the, the breakdown uh, of it. And I'm, I'm curious about these archetypes a little bit more. So do you see them as mapping to particular faculties? Like when you described it, it's like you have like the striker, which to, like to me as a man, it's like you kind of have like two main modes. You got work and warfare mode and work. So or work or warfare, that'd be the striker. Work would be Lord of the Earth, like the cultivator, the generator. And then you have this kind of father figure, which basically governs which mode you are in. Does that sound like a a an, a good mapping, or is there another way you see them yeah. sort of interacting? I, I think that that, yeah, I mean, I, not necessarily that they're just two, but like, I mean, I think they're you know, obviously three. But like, uh, and, and these are all systems are all just systems. So there are ways sure. there's ways to talk about. Our, our brains and their imaginary we're, lines we're, around the actual complexity yeah, yeah. of reality. I mean, like when yeah. people talk about like like has he has he really integrated his shadow? It's like you know that's just a word game that you're playing. Right now. Like, <laughs> like I know it means something. We can talk about what that means, but like that, there's not an actual shadow. <laughs> like, yeah. like yeah. calm down. Don't don't make that overly literal. Uh, like you don't actually have a king, warrior, magician, and lover in you. Like they're all you. Uh, right. You know, like like you need to. People need to like understand that when we're talking about these things, we're like here. Here's a way to talk about. About this and understand the world and that's really what myth is okay. uh you know like uh but yeah i think that uh i would say that the father has to do with the uh, conceptual conceptual uh, chaos okay like they, they, they each deal with a different form of chaos ah uh, basically the uh you know the father deals with conceptual chaos it's all the hard decisions okay it's all the like going back to words i mean like the bible you know the, the, the beginning there's a word right uh you know like everything comes from like a word is really a definition and a definition definition by definition separates things. Exactly. Uh, it, like uh, the father's always, it, I can get super word nerdy about this because like the words for all these things are so interrelated, like through history. There's a lot of that in fire in the dark 
where it's like you know rex the word for king you know comes to from like roots that mean to draw a straight line you know like they like they basically like all these things mean have to do with separating and drawing lines and that's what kings do and that's what you know like god figures do and father figures do is they they be, they make the rules and they draw lines like this is this and not that right this is this and not that like you know, and and then uh the uh, the striker you know like i said it's it, that's pretty warfare mode as you said that's uh he deals with physical chaos you know like in terms of like actual threats sure uh, that's his job is to deal with like actual physical threats would you and, say it's uh, also that's kind of like to apply it to the the modern man like getting his ass productive and like getting like like taking action or more like really just truly like actual visceral like hand-to-hand kind of combat threats I mean, I, I think it was being like the striker is a gym god for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's very. I think it's a very physical thing. You know, gotcha. Sort of like that's that's what that is for me. Uh, okay. You know, and uh, I mean, obviously, there's some a mental side of that that you can get into, like because men have to be prepared for fear and all the stuff that they do. And they but really, really fear. body focused, very concrete. Yeah, it's very yeah, it's very body focused. But obviously, there's a mental side of like martial arts. Of course, arts, you know, yeah, like I mean, it's, like, where it's like a th- three part yin yang. It's all pieced together, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then you get into the the, the Lord of the Earth. I mean, I, I think that the, you know a lot of the, just just productivity. Okay. Because like uh, most of life is, you know, I always say that's dealing with material chaos. Because the world is chaotic as we find it, and what we do is we build things from it. You know, like mm-hmm. let's you know take down that tree and like it t- turn into a house. Uh, you know, our, our job is to reshape the world to make it better for us, and and uh, and obviously just. Pro- you know, be productive to keep ourselves alive. Cause you know, 90% of what we do in life is just, um, you know, the productivity that we need to do to like survive. Yeah. You know, it's not like fun stuff. It's not like awesome, like glorious warrior work. And it's not like, like really high minded, like a uh, father work. A lot of it's just like, I need to go to the grocery store and I need to get my oil changed. And I need to like right. do all the just accounting and all the basic just work that needs yes. to get done. You know, and uh, the other side of that, which always comes with that figure, is you know fun. Hmm. <laughs> you know, because uh, you know, like you're you're dealing with material world, and then there's material wealth, and there's like enjoyment of that. Uh, you know, so you always have the, the the gods like Pan and Dionysus and and Frey, and obviously then they're kind of party gods as well. So like you know, you've done all the work for the harvest. Now the end of it is the harvest season, and you, know, you get to give the harvest festival. And uh, so you get both sides of that, like because we're here to enjoy life to a certain extent, and not yeah. just work. You know? I love so that. That's a, a balance. Yeah, that's a really cool uh, model. I like that a lot. That's I'm gonna have to finish the book and uh, uh, integrate that because I I really liked you know King Warrior Magician Lover kind of give you these archetypes to kind of to look at stuff and I can see there's a lot of depth to this this model as well. I'm gonna have to chew on that for a little bit. Yeah, and I dug into King Warrior Magician Lover uh, a lot as I was reading it because I was like. I, you know, I, I, there's stuff that I like about that, but also like, you know, it kind of was written by feminist pacifists. So like, there's, there's some stuff that, that, that like could be improved as far as I'm concerned, you know, like as far, you know, it's like the way they deal with the warrior, I think is a little bit soft. Uh, yeah. Like what that actually is. I mean, you're talking about a dude who kills people, you know, like, like, let's not like make it like it's all like rainbows and like kittens, uh, you know, like, you know, like it's not just like, you know, like standing up for yourself. Uh, you know, let's let's be a little more honest about what that role really has been historically and what it is, because uh, it's dark. Yeah, uh, a lot of times. I mean, dealing with the, warriors get their names. All the all the great heroes, we know them because of their monsters. Like they they you know like we know what monsters they killed. Right. Uh, you know like you know like you know whether it's Perseus or or Hercules or whatever, we know which uh, monsters they killed, and that's kind of what defines them, and because of what they did, because they're defined by their deeds. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a cool system. I, I like it a lot, and I think there's a lot of depth there. And that's kind of what I want to do for, a, for the rest of my life is to, to kind of build that out. And because uh, I think there's just, you know, yeah, like I said, there's a lot there and a lot, there's a lot of room for creativity there. Yeah, I can totally see that. You know, I, I even after playing around with King Warrior Magician Lover, I actually did a series on it years ago. I started like, you know, looking into like, like taking like, you know, they have like on a cross. Well, it's like, you know, what if we arrange it like this and then we see this other archetype of the jester and then we have the priest and then just like like those kind of things are just great just even if just for the exercise of it because they can help you just understand the the movements and the forces inside of you 
Um, I'm curious, have you ever read the book? Uh, have you read Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning? Uh, no, I, I did. I, that one I actually picked up because that would have been the one that I would have been interested in, in reading, I think. I read through the... I, I, I made it through kind of the beginning of it in the audiobook, I, and I was kind of already like, I know who you are. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I, like, I don't know. Like, I, Jordan Peterson, I always had a thing about because... Um, the way of men came out before he kind of blew up uh -huh. in our space. I mean, he probably wrote that book, I think before the way of men, but that was, you know, before he became really famous in the men's space, but yeah. the, it became a thing like the way of men was already out and whatever. And then I had all these dudes come and be like, dude, did you read Jordan Pearson? And I was like, I was like, no, no, I didn't. I came up with that by myself. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I totally so see that. Years, so for years, I didn't want to read him at all or like do I had I'm like, I, I don't know what he says. I know like because I wanted to claim like ignorance yes. of what he did. I did. I actually went and saw him speak recently and uh, you know, a friend got me a, a free ticket to it. And uh, then, you know, I, I, I have you know looked at a few things. I looked at Massive Meaning a little bit and I've watched some videos with him and I, he says pretty, pretty normal dad advice in most stuff. But the, the Massive Meaning thing would probably be the meatiest thing, I think, that would interest me. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was going to say. Like, you. if you've listened to a few of his lectures and stuff like that, like you can get like, that's pretty much what his uh, his more his recent two books are. But Maps of Meaning, that's, that's a big, that's a big one. That's like, you know, even if he did nothing else, that one would uh, always earn him like a place in like my, my high honors. I think you would have, I think you would have a kick with it. It might help you even flesh out your own model a little bit more. Um, not saying that, you know, putting you beneath him or whatever, just saying that just for, cause he, cause it delves very deep into the stories, like where you're talking about the myths, even if it just gives you something right. to draw from. Mm -hmm. But, um, I'm interested about like, so how did you settle on Germanic paganism? Like I saw, like you've been through quite a, a journey of beliefs. I was just like skimming articles and stuff like you were like, uh, <laughs> you know, what was it? Was it? Someone said like church of Satan at one point, then you're in like a, the, the yeah. some gang and then now it's uh germanic paganism and and i ask uh well right. go that because i got more questions about it okay what is that uh well i was you know that's always a good thing because you know my wikipedia is fantastic uh but it, it was written by like a, a gender queer uh, lesbian in boston <laughs> nothing i can do about it uh, <laughs> like, you can't sue sorry him. man you can't do anything yeah it's it is what it is uh so like uh if it seems like it was written by a gender queer lesbian in Boston, <laughs> like uh so, so uh it's like a list of my co crimes against communism okay but uh basically yeah it's i mean it was so anyway my history is i'm not i'm 47 so uh i have you know damn you look great saying, man well, you were just you're 47 thing. yeah you on you on the juice? Because you're looking you're looking swole these days, dude. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But uh, yeah, so you know, I try to take care of myself. Uh, but <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I was a priest in the Church of Satan in okay. like 2005. Uh, okay. like 2000, I think I left in 2007 or something. Now is the church of Satan, is that like the, the theatric one that likes to do the full rituals yeah. and stuff? Okay. That's, yeah. that's not the, isn't yeah, there I one was, where it's I more like a philosophy, like a more of like a nihilistic sort of do it, do what you want philosophy or is, isn't yeah, there like two of them? Yeah, or I was, yeah. I was, I mean, obviously I was a public representative representative of them for a little bit and okay. I, went, I did some TV spots even. Oh, and, wow. uh, and so but yeah, I mean, I always say that they're like theatrical atheists who like horror movies, mm -hmm. uh, I think is the best way to like describe it. They, and, and actually, it just kind of became over time almost because it overlapped with what was happening with the world so much that it, it almost became to the point where like, I'm like, okay, these are just like New York liberals now. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we believe in like, you know, like everybody can have sex with whoever they want. And, uh, you know, like, it's like, OK, so you're just normal. Now it wasn't edgy <laughs> enough for you. It wasn't edgy. the Satanists weren't edgy enough for you. So you left them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no. I mean, actually, I left. I mean, I, I think for a good reason. Uh, when I left Church of Satan, it was because I mean, I had a lot of friends there. Obviously, I mean, it was the kind of first thing. One of the first things I was involved in. And and. Uh, but I left actually because, you know, I, I started talking about the, you know, honor mm. and uh, it's important to masculinity and so forth. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, like that breaks down, like the honor doesn't really, isn't really compatible with uh, me first and fuck everyone else uh, kind of philosophy. 
Uh, sure. So there was a, I realized that there was a disconnect there and yeah. uh, that's, that's where I was like, okay, well, sayonara, you know, like, uh, so I, I pieced out of, of that. And uh, then I, I took, you know, I didn't want to be the person who jumped to the next thing, like right away. I kind of knew I was going to end up doing the Germanic paganism thing from there. There is a pathway. Uh, there's like a black metal Satanism to Germanic paganism kind of pathway that people nice. go on. But uh, I, I, I took a few years where I didn't really do anything. And uh, then uh, after I wrote The Way of Men, I joined this group uh, called the Wolves of Inland. And uh, they, they were doing Germanic paganism at the time. And I didn't really, I, like, I kind of thought that I was going that way, but I hadn't really f seen anyone do it right. I hadn't seen anyone that was doing it cool. And for whatever, uh, you know, negative things anyone or myself would say about them, um, I mean, they did some pretty neat rituals. Uh, <laughs> that, that was, that, there was some cool, I definitely had some cool experiences. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had, when you have a hundred dudes standing around a, a giant flaming ship that they had just built that day. Uh, I mean, that's pretty epic. I mean, there was some cool stuff that they did that they, you know, at least to get credit for that. Um, but, uh, you know, and so, you know, I, I was did that and I ended up having a chapter of their group. And then, you know, I was off on my own, though, on the other side of the country and, uh, you know, like bought some land. And then I was doing, you know, those rituals within the context of that group. But then, you know, eventually that kind of fell apart for a lot of personal reasons and political reasons and ideological reasons, whatever. Yeah. And um, then, uh, you know, I, I kept doing it because I really enjoyed that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I had this, I had this whole like, basically ritual space with temples that I had built myself and like uh, all kinds of things. And uh, and so I kept doing it for a couple of years um, and you know had my own group out there. And and uh, what's cool is that the uh, guy who I was working with, um, I mean, he's he's kind of evolved along parallel lines to me. We're not uh, he does his own thing because he's brilliant in his own way. His name's Clinton McMillan. And he was uh, working with me on rituals and stuff out there. And uh, he then ended up buying the land from me. And so when I wanted to leave Oregon, because I was like, Oregon is not a place where I want to stay. Uh, and after 2020, I was like, I'm out of here. Yeah. And so like I, uh, I, you know, I ended up selling the land to him because he has family there and a job there and whatever. And uh, so now he keeps that going out there. So he has a group out the, at the same land doing, you know, their, their own evolving thing. But uh, he's always about the thunder thing. Uh, the thunder and lightning God is kind of his deal. And it started out with Thor, but now, you know, he, you know, he talks about like Vajra, you know, it's a form of Buddhism uh, yeah. and, and works that in. He's, 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 he's kind of a savant in that way. He's, he helps me out with Proto-Indo-European and, and uh, he, he speaks a little Tibetan now and, and he'll, yeah. he'll go back and forth with all that stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, so... I was obviously doing that, you know, for a few years and I really enjoyed that. But that, like I said, that's when that question started happening as I was working on that. Like, I felt like there was a bigger thing mm. and it was rather than like, let's just pick this period of like 800 years or a thousand years or whatever, where people believe this one thing. Um, but we don't know that much about it really, because it's, it's been, we've lost a lot of it to history. Um, rather than pick that as being my whole frame, for everything let's look at the bigger frame mm. and uh you know and and you know connect with be able to connect with more people uh because obviously like that's very specific you know i mean i am you know mostly german i think 23 me says switzerland uh but uh it's yeah, yeah so i was i had some connection to that sure. ancestry wise which is what part of the reason why i originally chose it but uh you know there's so many other people that you can connect with and they're, they're all looking for something too i think now and so like like rather than being like well it would be cool if you could come to my thing but you know like you're you know like native american or whatever like right. like like i i just felt really hemmed in by that like trying to make cool a all these guys you know you're all these guys who just want to do the german thing because they're german uh half of those guys suck, but you guys are cool. And I would hang out with you guys. So like, can I hang out with the people that I like and do something like, you know, like, uh, so that's the, that's really where I ended up. I'm like, and it's a very American place to be, you know, like, uh, you know, like, um, rather than focusing on like the old world or whatever, um, you know, let's focus on, you know, Americans came here to be American. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different cultures and whatever. And so like, I'd much rather, uh, look at it from that perspective 
uh, right now. So that's that's kind of that's the whole evolution of where that comes from. But it's you know it's, uh, you know like I said on Wikipedia, it's like one paragraph, but like it, yeah, it's, uh, a lot to it. It is it is twenty years of growth, you know. So there's sure. that. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. That's that's really cool. Like so for for me, all that stuff makes sense. Like you know because I, you know I grew up you know very Catholic Catholic school that kind of thing. Um, High school, or later high school, and then college completely broke away. Went like into the Eastern stuff, and actually got uh, fairly, uh, very interested in occultism and New Age stuff. So it's like I understand, you know, the appeal, all that kind of thing. Uh, before eventually reverting back to Catholicism, but the uh, the most people would probably hear this and be like, "What the fuck is this guy doing? Like he does like rituals? Like what is like?" Break it down, like why, like what is the purpose? Like what are you trying to co- accomplish with uh, these sort of rituals and practices? Like why, why do that? Are you just like, you know, it seems very strange to the average person. Well, I mean, church is a ritual. That's where it comes from. Right. <laughs> like that's that's what mass is. But most Half people think Half mass is stupid now too. So it's like, yeah, yeah. What they, is well, what's the purpose that, like, of all this? I mean, I was raised Catholic originally too. I mean, like, mm. that's what I mean. And and you know, if you explored the occult stuff, I mean, it's really hard to parse out like how much of it is just you know reappropriations of mass. And that, I mean, that's, some of it's like it, blatantly that. that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when you get in the Satanism and stuff, it's just inversions of right. Catholicism. That's what Satanism originally was because right. it didn't care about Protestantism at that point. You know, so it was just Catholicism. And so, um, and that I was also from that with the Germanic pagan stuff as well. And I, so I had to take a real look at that and it, as I kind of figured all this stuff out, because you start doing a thing because this is what they do when they do the thing and you figure it out and you learn the process like everything else. And then as I investigated it more, I was like, well, how much of this is taken from ceremonial magic? Um, which ceremonial magic is then comes from mass <laughs> and you know, right. is some version of mass. And so like, what parts of this are original to it? And what, why would you do it? I mean, that's a really good question. Like, why would you uh, perform a ritual? Like, why would you have mass? Right. Yeah. And really, the reason actually for that is more or less all the same. Um, yeah. Like, there's a few different kinds of rituals that you do, and anthropologists will write about this. Um, you know, reasons to whether you're doing a marker in time, whether it's like a marriage, you know, like some which is initiate an initiation into another phase of life. Um, that's why people have tried to down a lot of rituals where like initiations from boyhood to adulthood, initiation from which is obviously mythical. People are really into that. Uh, you know, transition from like unmarried to married, mm-hmm. um, all these different role changes that, that people do rituals for those. And that's to make, to add significance to it. Yes. You know, right. Rather than just like, I signed a paper, now I'm a thing. Right. Uh, it, it's, it, it adds this, you know, because we are emotional creatures. And we need to be able to act things layer. out. Like you make it harder, yeah. it actually means something more, right? Yeah, and and it's weird actually. I mean, because I do have a background because I came from the Church of Satan or whatever originally. Not, I mean, not right originally. I came from Catholicism, I guess originally. But uh, um, Anton Lavey was really into. Uh, he he called it psychodrama, mm-hmm. and that was a big. That was very popular terminology for that at the time. And it, basically, you need to act it out and, and engage in your emotions with it, and it, ha- it serves a purpose for that. And, uh, and so, you know, like I still like kind of use that because that makes sense, uh, you know, engage that the emotional side of ourselves. And uh, so that's interesting. And then, and that's one reason you do ritual. And I, I think another reason that people go to church or do any kind of ritual is to affirm their identity and their common beliefs. Hmm. Because, you know, if you have an identity, a common belief, you can put your little things under your Instagram handle that say what they are, all your little emoticons that say like, I'm this group and not that group or whatever. And that can be what you do. And oh, look, I'm a thing. Um, but there is something a lot deeper that comes when you go and do that with other people. Uh, becomes very emotionally powerful um, to go and, and be the same thing with other people. That's interesting. And, you know, like I used to say, uh, when I talked about it with the wolves, when I talked about it with, with uh, Germanic paganism, like we are what we are because we do this thing together. And I think that that's a lot of what ritual is. And that's a lot of what religious mm-hmm. people do. It's like, you know, like, you know, like, would you be, you know, like you're kind of Catholic because you're more Catholic when you went to mass. <laughs> right. You went to math, math every month. You had that experience and said the words with the people. And, uh, you know, you, you, you had the communion and you, you know, you shook the hands and did all the things that they do in that church that, that makes that 
that's that whole that total experience. Hmm. And and I think ritual serves that purpose uh, for a lot of people. When when I had a, a, a very specific tribe, I don't have one right now, uh, but when I had my own tribe, um, we had you know all these guys who basically believe the same thing, and they're motivated by the same stories, and they you know they've built that story out in their mind to be bigger than it is on paper. You know, I was I was joked uh, like I've used this a million times, but uh, uh, a lot of guys who are in the military, like, like the God tier, um, who is the God who's, there's only one story about it. And, uh, the, the story about him is that he, uh, to make this trick that the gods are trying to play on the wolf, uh, legal, he offered to put his hand in the wolf's mouth so that they can bind the wolf and, okay. and with knowing that he would lose his hand. And so a lot of military guys see that as a, as a significant of, of duty. Hmm. and self-sacrifice for the greater good and so they really key in on that but it's a very short story about and that's all that we know about that god huh. <laughs> but uh so but guys will build that out in their mind because that means a lot to them that idea right. means a lot to them and i think that happens with it happens with christianity it happens with all kinds of things you know people connect with one story and it becomes bigger for them in their mind and so like to get a bunch of guys together to, who you know know those stories and they've all been moved by the same stories and then to talk about that story in some way, like you would in church, like like let's read from this passage of the Bible, and then you know talk about what that means, and then and then you know put it in a ritual context, um, you know because and that becomes very powerful because it isn't just them at home looking at a book and reading it with oh this is a cool story, right? And then it becomes this thing that they've gone and done with other guys, yeah, and, and so it, it's very, very emotionally powerful. I agree with you. Yes, it is. If it's done properly and it's not just like a rote thing because your parents did it and you just haven't stopped doing it or whatever. Um, and it seems to me like really ritual is it's one of our oldest technologies and it's a psychological technology. It's designed to make practical the metaphysical, the ephemeral, right? Because we all have this this deep, this depth to our soul. There's a part of us that's that's looking for the transcendent, but we can't touch it. And so we need to find ways to play it out. And that's really what it, that's what it seems to me. It's like a, you know, a, a method for um, making sense of that, you know, spiritual instinct. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. Uh, yeah, yeah, we need we do we need to, to, to see something. We all I mean, when I asked people for years, because I was like, what is my job? Because I'm like, I was basically a priest. And yeah. I have all the guys who come out just to, to you know, see the guy for the internet do the thing. <laughs> and uh, I would I would talk to them and, and I would ask like what does that mean to you like what is I, I want to you know I feel like I want to get in touch with something spiritual you know like a lot of them would say that um, like what does that mean like what do you want to what do you what do you what are you trying to do here what do you want me to do because I know what my job is like I had to go out and say the words and do the thing um, but like what am I giving to you and it hmm. was very interesting to me and so when I answered that, a lot of it was they want to connect to something bigger. Hmm. And that's kind of universally when people say, I want to get right. more spiritual. That's what they mean is I want to connect to something bigger than myself. Yeah. And so that's why, like when I wrote, uh, you know, Fire in the Dark, I mean, that was one of the things I'm like, well, what's bigger than you, you know, like, you know, because I, you know, I started out Catholic, but I, you know, ditched that very early on. And, uh, you know, like really considered myself an atheist for many years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so... You know, I'm a very logic, a very pragmatic-minded guy in many ways. I'm like, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. Well, why do they really say that? Yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, like, I mean, that's that's sure. kind of like how I look at the world. Um, you know, so you know, but people are, you know, so in order to satisfy myself and not feel like I was bullshitting myself, like, what can I look at in a, in a bigger way? And these stories, you know, this thing that this these men have always done. Uh, you know, this, this repetition of these these particular stories, whether you know about this idea of the father or the striker, or the lord of the earth, uh, you know, the, the killing the dragon. It's like one of the oldest poetic uh, phrases. Is like "hogum gwent," "hogum gwent." I think is the is the Proto European for it. Hmm. Uh, it. But it means he he killed the serpent. Or he killed the dragon. I probably butchered it. it, it Proto European is off the article anyway. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, he. Uh, that's one of the oldest, you know, poetic forms. And that story that's like, he killed the dragon is this important thing to us. Uh, you know, like that's what's older than that, you know, like, like what's right. older than that, what's bigger than that. 
And so that's why I really, this kind of idea of connected with me, it's like, well, I can connect with something bigger and I don't have to like put all that aside and believe something I don't actually believe. You know, yes. And I could actually be like, well, yeah, dudes have always said this. And what difference does it make whether it's real or not? You right. Because <laughs> like, it serves a psychological that's... utility to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it basically, it, it, over and over again, it becomes this is this is as real as anything gets. <laughs> you know, like this is as real. I mean, something that has been around with us since the beginning of recorded history is as real as it gets. And so, like, um, that's that's pretty old. And so like that's that was kind of how I I needed to put it in the right frame for myself so I could not like I said not feel like I was bullshitting myself. Um, yeah. I'm very I'm pretty good at uh, you know trying not to do that. Yeah. I mean it seems like you know you you're very you're clearly a critical thinker and you've you've delved pretty deep into all this stuff. Now we're like we're pushing 2 hours here so I mean there's a bunch of th- more things I want to talk to you about so I guess I'm going to have to have you back if you're willing because I would love to talk to you really a lot more about religion. I want to talk to you about your art. Your art's fucking nuts, dude. I I'm obsessed with it. Like it's so cool. I'm going to make I'm going to start making my my backgrounds and stuff. Like you do it with AI? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to even call that my art at this point. But okay. like, uh, I mean, because I did go to art school, and I'm, I'm actually uh, taking some figure drawing classes now to get my hand back because I was very good at drawing for a long time, and I have to get it back because uh, I want to start actually making art because I have all these archetypes. I'm like, I tried to hire people to illustrate them, and I, I really either couldn't get them to work for me, or like they just weren't very good. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, well, I could do this better. So I guess it's my job. And so <laughs> I, I have to just get my chops back and learn how to do it. But because of it as an overture, this uh, mid journey AI came out and I just was like, Hey, what is this? And uh, looked into it and it's really good. I mean, I've tried a couple of AIs before that. I was just like, let's just see what this is. I mean, what do you just like pick a picture and it'll just like do shit for you or no, no, no. no. It, um, I mean, uh, they, there's several of them and a lot of them work differently. But uh, Mid Journey, it's a series of prompts. Okay. Like basically, you are telling it what to make, and then it's going to reinterpret what you, it's going to try and understand what you want it to make as best as it can. Oh, wow. But it's just really good. Uh, they, they, it's really, really good at doing stuff. And, and sometimes like it's not that good with people. It's getting better. They, re, they upgraded it recently, and it got better with doing people, oh, wow. uh, which is kind of scary. But like uh, it, it's it's taking like you can basically you know talk about like the aspect ratio of what you want and the kind of composition you can feed it like you can feel it feed it film directors okay and like you know different kind of rendering systems or like you can filter it through three or four different artists you know like so if you're very art literate and i happen to be fairly art literate like you'd be like well i want that uh you know it could be a kind of a combination of like rembrandt and mobius which sounds crazy but uh, like, and like if, if you put it, like I have a string, you know, that I like for a while and then they, they upgraded it and then my string kind of got stupid. I didn't like it anymore. So now like you keep playing with these, like hmm. what if I change this artist here and this artist here and change the order of these words, can I get it to get closer to what I have in my head? That's interesting. And so you're playing this little game with words. So really I have a guy who, uh, you know, like in my uh, put that page, the uh, PH2T3R on Instagram, I've been playing with that a lot recently. And that's where we've been putting up a lot of this art. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Bronson, uh, who has a podcast and, uh, you know, he's, I've known him for a few years and he's, he's basically a musician, uh, by trade. I mean, he, he does music and, uh, but he's you know, obviously interested in art and all this stuff. So he's, he's been plugging away at this. He just put out his first NFTs with, <laughs> with, uh, mid dirty AI cause he's sick. interested in kind of like indigenous cultures and whatever. Cause he has a little bit, of, I think he's Canadian and he has a little bit of that in him. And so he's like been building like Aztec sun gods and all kinds of stuff with uh, this stuff. So it's, it's been really interesting to play with. I mean, ultimately it has some limitations and uh, you know, I really want to be able to have it control it and really feel like it's hundred percent my work. Sure. Um, you know, but it, it is brilliant with composition in a way that I could never come up with. Like, I'm like, you know, people will definitely from now on be using this for like, I'm going to let it brainstorm compositions for me and then, yeah. you know, do the work. But right. like, uh, yeah, cause a lot of really good art, artists and illustrators are in there doing it yeah. and they're posting up work too. Cause it's, it's a really neat tool. But it yeah, is. so I've been, I've been playing with that, but that's, that's definitely kind of like the overture to me making my own art. But, uh, it is, it is exciting. It's an exciting tool cause I can generate four images in a minute. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, and, and so you just keep going and going and going, but it's like, it becomes like a crack addiction. Like, it, like, I feel like I'm in Vegas, like putting money in the slot, machine, like, <laughs> like make it, but for making art. So it's really weird. <laughs> That's funny. That's cool though. I mean, like yeah. for someone who's as interested yeah. in aesthetics as yourself, uh, I imagine it, yeah. it is, it's just, it's kind of a blast to play with. Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's really fun. Well, awesome, man. Like, uh, so where, where can people find you? What, what should they check out if they're, they're interested to hear more from you? Cool. Well, we talked about it uh, and it's hard to remember. So, uh, PH two T three R it's a proto Indo European with how you'd spell a potato, which is father. It's the root word of father. And that's a project. And I, I have, that's my Twitter handle is PH two T three R. And my, uh, I have an Instagram account with, that I've been working on. That's PH two T three R and T three R. And I've, uh, um, also commissioned some music uh, from guys and like you're trying to, I'm basically trying to build out this culture. Like what, what could this really be? Cool. Uh, all these Doing some real world stuff. building for the, the, yeah. what would you, for the, uh, what are you calling it? The, I forget what solar the, idealism. That's it. Yeah. Word? Yes. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. So like all yeah, kind yeah, of in yeah. that universe, right. In that yeah. solar system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Like what would you, what would this look like? Like let's okay. build this out. Let's, let's build this dream. And so that's kind of my project. When you get your own metal subgenre, that's when you know you'll, you've arrived. I we do have one of the guys that does have a metal band. Okay. <laughs> solar metal. So yeah. Solar metal. Okay, oh, you're there. You're here, so baby. Like, I, I feel like the the group's name is Anahata, and they've already put out one album. <laughs> but uh, so I, I don't know if it's a genre yet. But uh, anyway, so yeah, we've been doing that, and then. Uh, the world i'm also on youtube uh you can find me on youtube and uh, uh my website is jackdassjonathan.com and all my books are on amazon and uh audible as audiobooks and i read them okay awesome well thank you so much for being here i really appreciate it, it was awesome uh to talk to you a uh, very interesting conversation and definitely want to do this again